Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, I'm president of the Institute, and it's my distinct privilege today to get to introduce and host Chairman Kevin Brady, Congressman of the 8th District of Texas in the U.S. House of Representatives, and of course, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, Kevin Brady, as many of you know, is someone who we love to hear from because in a world where many politicians purport to speak their mind, many of them either don't or don't have much to say. Congressman Brady speaks his mind genuinely and always has something substantive to say. And in that regard, we are delighted to have him here today addressing rethinking trade and reframing the trade debate. This is a time, as we discussed at our launch of our presidential trade policies briefing last week, when the bipartisan and arguably nonpartisan justified consensus for open markets and trade is under attack from both left and right in a way that is unprecedented, at least in decades in the U.S., one of the few people to stand up and speak frankly, substantively, coherently, and in my view, persuasively about trade in America's interest is Chairman Brady. Before becoming chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, he served as chairman of the Influential Health Subcommittee, and he was previously chairman and vice chairman of the Joint Economic Committee. I got to know him then when I had the pleasure to testify before his committee on issues of Federal Reserve accountability. Um, until 2013, Kevin was the leader of the Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee and led the successful effort to pass new trade agreements with Panama, South Korea, and Colombia. Prior to his election to Congress in 1997, Chairman Brady worked as Chamber of Commerce Executive for 18 years and served six years in the Texas House of Representatives. We obviously have a full house of people who know the significance of the ch chairman's role and the chairman's thinking. And so I will now turn the podium over to him so we may be enlightened. Congressman Brady. Doctor, thank you very much for uh, not just the kind of introduction. Thank you for your leadership of the Institute. This is a Thanks for hosting this event, and you continue. This is one of the most respected organizations pushing, I think, the boundaries of academic thought in public discourse, discourse and policy formation, uh, the work that you are doing uh, now, the work that uh, Fred has done for many years has really put you at the center of many of our key issues, not just trade, but Federal Reserve, uh, monetary policy, tax policy as well. So thank you for having me here uh, today. This is a perfect day to be talking about rethinking trade. Um, history, it just so happens, I'm not much of a historian. Turns out this day in history is a bit unique uh, on sort of game-changing, thought-changing actions. On this day in 1825, the world's first public railroad to use steam locomotives was opened in Northeast England. It made America rethink its transportation network. On this day in 1905, Albert Einstein's famous paper introduced the equation E equals MC squared was first published. That made us rethink when solid energy explodes and there's hidden energy, solid matter explodes and hidden energy inside, made us rethink everything. And on this day in 1954, school integration officially began in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore public schools, making us rethink the concept of equality in America. So this was the perfect day for us to be rethinking and re-examining U.S. trade policies. I'm convinced done right and properly enforced, free and fair trade allows individuals, families, communities, and countries to raise themselves out of poverty and into prosperity. Free trade lies at the, the, at the heart of our nation's post-World War II prosperity, in my view, the freedom to trade is perhaps our greatest economic freedom here in America. And as we look to the future, the importance of reexamining and rethinking 
our nation's trade policies can't be overstated. Uh, just in the past couple of decades, uh, we have seen dramatic changes to nearly every facet of global commerce. Uh, these um, advancements have opened incredible opportunities for American businesses, workers, and consumers, but they've also posed significant cha challenges for policymakers. You know, our mission moving forward has to be to pursue trade policies that reflect the challenges and opportunities facing Americans while also promoting competition and growth. Uh, I'm convinced uh, that as we rethink trade, you know, part of the challenge going forward is we need at every opportunity to make free trade more free. You know, our trade agreements should be more aggressive, less protectionist, they should be bolder. Uh, selling mediocre trade agreements is hard. Selling bolder ones are more valuable. We ought to, at every opportunity, reject early harvests in any trade agreement that we're in and push trade negotiators to dig deeper on behalf of consumers. Um, and make sure that those trade agreements have the strongest implementation plans to assure that they actually achieve what they're laying out to do. Secondly, I would, I would hope we can continue to focus on trade, not necessarily adding more social issues to this. The May 10th agreement was a good solid balance that has allowed both parties to move forward uh, in a positive way on trade. I think the more others try to load these agreements with non-trade issues from climate change to social rights, I think it is, it is tougher to achieve the original goal. Just lifting families and countries out of poverty and into prosperity is powerful enough. And frankly, that's tough enough to achieve. But doing that, in my view, you know, when, you, when a family is going to bed hungry in a third world country, you know, shivering under a makeshift tin roof, you know, they're not focused on environmental advancements and labor rights. But that prosperity, the opportunity to to sell their wares around the world, to stretch that meager budget farther with, with better priced goods, that's what helps lift them out of poverty. That alone is, I think, one of the greatest powers of what we're doing in trade. And I, and I would begin to link trade with tax reform in a major way. I think, frankly, trade bears the bl uh, too much the brunt for an uncompetitive U.S. tax code. And I think decisions businesses often make to be competitive, both here and abroad, are as much or more linked to our tax reform or our tax problems in America, our code, uh, rather than on trade itself, which is one of the reasons that uh, the House Republicans, in our better way um, um, tax reform, are focused on making U.S. competitive and, and eliminating any incentives in the tax code to move manufacturing, research, or headquarters overseas. We ought to be talking about the two if we're serious about getting the economy growing for America. I think, too, moving forward, it's crucial, especially right now, watching this presidential campaign uh, as it, uh, it runs itself out to November, I think it's crucial for the American people to understand that uh, freedom to trade isn't about China. It's about, not about Mexico, Europe, or Asia. It's about protecting our individual freedom to trade as Americans, to buy, sell, and compete anywhere in the world with as little government interference as possible. That's the heart of our free enterprise system. That's what the freedom to trade brings us. So for the entrepreneur toiling uh, deep into the night in the garage uh, on working on their new breakthrough product, this freedom ensures they have an opportunity to put that product on the market and make it available throughout the world. For American consumers, for families, for that single mom, the freedom to trade protects your ability to purchase whatever products you choose and keep prices for your goods as affordable as it needs to be for you and your family. And I, the reason, one of the reasons I love economic freedom and the freedom to trade, it really answers a key question. Who has the power? Who has the power to decide what products you can buy and what, at what price? Is it Washington that has the power? Is it special interest groups? Or is it you, the consumer? Free trade ensures that it is the consumer 
that ultimately has the power to decide what to buy and at what price. I'm also convinced that while we live in an anti-establishment era, both here and around the world, the freedom to trade is the most anti-establishment power Americans enjoy. It guarantees that when a new product is designed or a better service unveiled or a new breakthrough technology is produced that special interest says special interests can't hold you back from selling it or buying it or even disrupting an entire industry if you discovered and delivered a product or service better than what exists today. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, this is what Thomas Jefferson meant when he wrote, commerce with other nations isn't only necessary and beneficial to all parties, it is right, it is a right and a duty. The freedom to trade is a right in America, uh, and we ought to uh, keep that for, in, in the forefront as we work through this debate. He also, Thomas Jefferson explained, in order to function properly, free trade must be established on a reciprocal basis. And this is another crucial part that shouldn't be left um, out of this debate. Um, free trade agreements tell our foreign competitors they cannot sell one way into the United States unless we can sell two way into their country, into their markets. And when we do that and level the playing field, America is incredibly successful from a sales standpoint, but also incredibly successful for that single mom looking for the best products at the most uh, affordable price. Reciprocity, while it doesn't, um, isn't a language you hear in most of our debates, it's sort of the golden rule on trade. Countries don't live up to their obligations. Our trade agreements and WTO rules provide us with the tools to challenge them. And if necessary, retaliate. Enforcement, holding our trading partners accountable, that's part of the commitment we make to the American people. And I'm proud to, to, to say that this year Congress has acted to give this administration and future administrations the strongest enforcement tools that we've had in modern UN, U.S. history. Uh, so when we open up new markets to American-made goods through trade agreements and strictly enforce those agreements, America wins. So to today, where are we on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? I think this agreement represents a tremendous opportunity to open up more markets, uh, more critical markets in two-way trade. It is a chance for the United States to write the rules of this 21st century global commerce, and it provides unmistakable geostrategic benefits. As the Institute's recent uh, book makes clear, the Trans-Pacific Partnership represents a major opportunity to grow our economy, increase wages and purchasing power for American families, and secure U.S. national interests in Asia. My view is that it is exactly the same. You know, I, in my town hall meetings on trade, and I do a lot of them back in Texas, you know, I always talk about the Asia Pacific as being the area with the, what, the, that will have half of all the middle class customers on the planet in that Asia Pacific region. So just as when reporters asked um, Willie Sutton why he robbed banks, and he said, well, that's where the money's at. Why do we want to be in the Asia Pacific? That's where the customers are at. We want our workers, our farmers, our businesses competing on a level playing field uh, in that uh, lucrative market. Um, but as we pursue this, the agreement has to be done right. There are still several significant uh, concerns by, from members of Congress that the administration has to address to get the necessary votes. Now, these aren't minor de details either. They are key issues for American businesses, for workers, and consumers. As I've said repeatedly, the substance of the agreement will drive its timing. Ultimately, Congress controls the clock, and we control where the agreement is approved. So we'll move only when the administration addresses these concerns. Otherwise, we won't have the votes to pass it. And if you remember nothing else today, I think here's the key. We are running out of time if the White House wants to get it done this year, as I hope we do. The White House has responsibility uh, to address these longstanding concerns quickly, make sure it's getting support from both sides of the aisle. We are certainly working uh, in the House to facilitate the meetings, the discussions, um, the ideas. 
on how we resolve these outstanding um, issues so that we can be in a position uh, to move uh, this legislation, hopefully again, this year. And so let me sort of conclude, uh, Doctor, and I'll be glad to take questions. As I said at the outset, we have to carefully examine and re-examine our trade policies, make sure they're hitting the mark in the 21st century. We have to lead on trade with this White House and the next, with the rest of the world, more importantly, with the American people. And to do that successfully, we have to reframe the debate back to the power of economic freedom. We have to make clear this is about protecting our freedom to trade, our freedom to buy and sell and compete throughout the world with as little government interference as possible. And given uh, all that's at stake, we can't afford to disengage. We have to stand up and stand up aggressively for our freedom to trade. So Dr. Posen, I would be glad to stop and take some easy questions from the audience uh, uh, here today. Oh, sure. Thank you so much, Chairman Brady. Short, sweet, to the point, historical references, and finally bringing us to today. Before I open it up to our distinguished audience, uh, could I pose just a couple mm -hmm. easy questions for you? Um, I knew that wasn't going to happen. I was just trying to suggest it. You, 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 you can handle it. It's reciprocal. Um, obviously, as you said, we're all aware this is a time of much more pushback on trade, much more fear among Congress people even who recognize the worth of it to come up and stand up for it as they once did. Whoever wins the presidential election on November 8th, yeah. we know two things. First, almost certainly your party will retain the majority in the House and we assume you will retain chairmanship of Ways and Means. And secondly, whichever candidate wins, and we've pointed out that one candidate's trade policies are a lot worse than the others, but anyway, wh whichever candidate wins, neither of them want to pass TPP, neither of them want to pursue new trade openings, it seems. How do you in your role expect to work with an administration that has that kind yeah. of attitude. You know, I, I'm sort of reading beh uh, uh, between the lines uh, on our presidential nominees. And I think back to eight years where, you know, even in the, Dem well, in the Democrat Party, both Senators Clinton and Obama were, you know, fighting each other to decide who would rip up NAFTA quickest and who would join Charles Schumer and Lindsey Graham on a 27% uh, excise or tariff increase on China, but we saw governance much different right. than that. Uh, President Obama um, quickly determined trade is a major power for us economically here at home and throughout the world as well. I'm not surprised trade is is uh, struggling in public opinion right now. This has been financial crises are tough. It's been a very slow recovery. More look, two out of three Americans still think we're in some type of recession and trade tends to suffer, you know what I mean, take the blame for that, especially in a world that's so global as it is today. So, you know, um, to be expected a bit, here's what's frustrating. I think uh, both of our presidential candidates need to be making the case, and they have occasionally dipped their toe into, Mr. Trump has made the case, enforcement first. Mm -hmm. You know, isolation and trade isn't, isn't acceptable. He's correct in both of those. I think both candidates... Um, want to go enforcement first, that's terrific, but we've got to be aggressive in the outreach as well. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful we can work with both, uh, both to, to um, improve and uh, pass TPP if it isn't, doesn't, isn't done by the end of the year, which I hope it is, ready for and considered for a vote. Um, I'm convinced, again, if we're serious about growing the economy, um, it's not enough simply to fix the way we tax. 
we have to have those markets right. to sell and ship to. Trade is so critical to that. And I think the economy is going to be, and national security, the two biggest issues for that new president. They've got to know we can't do it if we're building walls, protectionism, isolation in the trade area. And so much there to your answer. One of the most interesting things you said in your opening speech and in your reply just now is this potential linkage between how American multinationals, American corporations who trade are taxed and the trade policy. Again, an issue that keeps coming up, whether it's Apple in Ireland or Pfizer or any of these, is the issue of, of repatriation of, of profits. How do you see that agenda going forward from your seat? Obviously, it weighs yeah. and means. Well, I'm hopeful. We have a, in Speaker Ryan, well, he's given us a green light on some of the biggest challenges facing America, certainly from ways, means, perspective, welfare reform, health care, Medicare reform, and then uh, a new tax reform system. We laid out our blueprint, uh, uh, and uh, this speaker in our committee, in our conference, has made a commitment to bring this to a vote in 2017, regardless of the outcome of the election. So, you know, it's football season, so the analogy would be, for the first time in 30 years, we're going to put the ball on the court, on the field. We're going to move it down that field. I'm hopeful we can um, achieve it. It goes hand in hand with trade because today our companies struggle to compete around the world. When they compete and win, we're about the only country that has a wall that, that taxes them to bring those profits and employ them back here in research or manufacturing or growth. Uh, our tax reform blueprint um, changes all that. We're not taxing worldwide. The tax rate to bring those profits back home will be zero. We're proposing a border adjustable tax approach that m mirrors what occurs in China and Europe, other competitors. That way we lift taxes off our exports. There will be a tax on the import. What that does, it virtually eliminates any incentive to send jobs in manufacturing research overseas. Co price will, uh, competition will occur on price and quality and service, which whether you're in trade or in tax policy, that's exactly where you want it to be. And so I, I'm convinced tax and trade can move forward um, in the new year. That's very exciting. To just pick up on your football analogy for a second, um, one of the things about playing big time football, <laughs> which you from Texas know, is there's always another game somewhere else at the same time. I mean, you mentioned the issue of national security in Asia Pacific. One of the things that we've studied here at the Institute is the idea that Obviously, China is proposing RCEP and a bunch of bilateral or, or smaller trade deals. There are other deals being done by the EU with various countries. Our colleague Fred Bergson has spoken for a long time about competitive liberalization. I mean, do your colleagues in Congress think about this issue that if, if we don't move the ball down the field, we just defend? Meanwhile, there's still another game being yeah. played at the next yeah. stadium? You know, yes. But I don't think the public does. Okay. You know, I, I my advice to, to both these nominees is uh, don't av don't abandon the trade field in the Asia Pacific because that game's going on whether we're on the field exactly. or not. And those countries are competing aggressively and writing those trade rules, and it has huge impact uh, on us. I think both uh, inherently understand that. I think a lot of members of Congress do. It's not necessarily an easy sell at home. You know what I mean? Because it just seems big. Um, trade, in my view, we sell these through our local examples. Right. You know what I mean? That business down the street that has four out of every uh, ten workers selling products, paper products, into South America or China. I think we win those trade debates through examples at home. But I think for some of the public, they understand how globally competitive it is out there. So. Great. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to turn it open to our audience. Chair Brady has graciously agreed to take questions on the record. Um, we have a standing, we have a moving mic up front with Jessica. There's a standing mic in back. Please uh, raise your hand if you'd like to be recognized. And uh, please identify yourself when you're given the microphone. One other caveat, the more what you say sounds like a question instead of a speech, <laughs> the more time you get. The more it sounds like a speech instead of a question, the less time you get. Reciprocity. That's reciprocity. I like that so one. So right there, the gentleman, please, Jessica. 
Thank you, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for joining us today. I'm Rick Johnston with Citibank. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, looking forward to next year, and apropos to the, to the topic of today, are you giving thought, is the committee giving thought to addressing the question of what has been called trade adjustment assistance, maybe we ought to call it the Freedom to Trade Support Act, but something to counteract this growing fear of globalization and what appears to be also sort of a, a more deep-seated problem for our demographics. As our, as our population tends to get older, I think people are more and more inspired to simply protect what they've got. Yeah. And are very fearful of change. Yeah. And can I, the answer would be, can we go a little bigger than that? In the sense, we have 33 separate job training programs or more. They're all segmented, rarely um, combined with each other. Uh, until this year, Congress had never really, we just passed legislation to set up the measurements so we can really figure out which are working and which are not. And I think trade adjustment assistance fits into that bigger issue because we ought to figure out what's working and what's not and rethink you know, how we provide that job training. My impression today is that um, TAA, like the other job training programs, isn't very effective, isn't worker-driven, isn't flexible enough, and as a result, I don't think we give people the tools to be able to either get that new skill, you know, or relocate to where their skill is needed, and I think because we have such a mismatch between skills and jobs around the country, I think Americans have to have that flexibility. The, the other thing, too, and it's sort of to take it even a step further, besides making uh, trade adjustment assistance and job training smarter and more effective, I really do think a stronger economy tied to a, a better tax code hastens the relocation of jobs within a community to pick up the ones that are lost. And frankly, uh, our goal in tax reform is not simply to, to stem the tide of businesses moving jobs overseas. Our goal in the whole design of this is to bring that investment back in jobs and research and manufacturing so that when that next project comes up, they may choose that community that has an ample workforce already ready to go. So I think, sorry, that was a short answer, a long question, <laughs> but job training needs to be smarter, including job uh, training, uh, TAA, and I think tax reform can help us strengthen um, the opportunities in the community. Great. At the back microphone, please. Thanks. Um, Sean Donnelly from the U.S. Council for International Business. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership on trade and so many other issues. Could you talk a little bit about how you see investment fitting into trade agreements? Uh, some of the opponents have demonized uh, arbitration or investor state yeah. dispute settlement in the TPP. and. Uh, Europe seems to have a radical new idea about how to do investment in, uh, in the TTIP. How, how important and where do you see that going? Thanks. Well, first, the answer, short answer is it's critically important. We need to continue to insist on that provision. I will tell you as you introduce yourself, so my youngest son's name is Sean Donnelly Brady, just so you know. <laughs> uh, so the whole time I was smiling um, as you asked questions. Critically important, look, this is um, for, for all parties for the assurance for U.S. investors to make that investment where those private property rights and those investment rights are protected or there's an option to make sure they're protected, critical for U.S. investors. One, one of the best parts, I think, of our trade agreement, but also critical for that country wanting that new foreign investment. And you would think, okay, that makes sense in a, a developing country, for example, you know, where they're really looking for that long-term sustainable investment from U.S. companies. But I also think it matters in a TTIP in Europe. Boy, looking at those 28 countries, you know, that patchwork of investment protections, laws, and all that, you know, I think you create more certainty, I think a better chance for investment two-way. And I, and I think the TTIP agreement sort of has taken a step farther. Really important. These are two major markets, um, long-standing trade partners with long-standing disputes. I think one of the values of TTIP is not just to modernize those trade flows, but to resolve some of those long-standing disputes that we've been playing out at the WTO, playing it out by proxy and other trade agreements. I really think this is an opportunity for us to address those issues straight on, 
as well. So um, short answer, critically important provision. We ought to continue to fight to make it as, as strong and aggressive and robust as possible um, because because it makes it, it makes those agreements more valuable. Thank you. First up front and then back to the back mic. Um, Mr. Chairman, Bill Lane, good to see you again. Um, maybe you can help with some clarification or uh, explain something to me. There are 7 billion people that live outside of the United States. We have trade agreements with 20 countries representing about 400 million of those 7 billion people. Half of American exports go to those 400 million people. By any objective measure, the 20 free trade agreements have been phenomenally, phenomenally positive. The most positive of which was NAFTA. A third of our exports goes to two countries representing 150 million people. Why is it we go through a debate last night and people are targeting our biggest export markets? And my question is, when people contemplate a trade war, why would they target our two biggest export markets to start that trade war with? Are we doing a lousy, obviously someone's doing a lousy job explaining that you, you don't attack your closest customers. But secondly, we're not engaged in the debate, we being the business community. Please give us some guidance. Be, before your son, let me just piggyback a bit on Bill so it's not quite such an easy slam dunk. Um, <laughs> we, we, really, we, did you have to you, say No, 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 no. We, we, yeah, you set it up, I'll spike it. Yeah, right. Um, just you do this incredible program of town halls and outreach in Texas, not just in your district. We think of Houston, we think of Texas in general as benefiting enormously from NAFTA. This is sort of just a parallel to what Bill's saying. What is it among your constituents, voters in Texas, that they don't feel comfortable? Is it yeah. just the perception of a bad economy? Why does it take the form of being so anti-NAFTA, where Texas would seem to have gained so much? Yeah, and, 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 it, and you do have that. You know, even in yeah. this remarkable exporting state. Um, two things. Um, first, the, um, the, the downside of trade is visible, and you can look at the plant down the street or a job that is lost, and you know it, you can see it. The benefits of free trade, the jobs that are created one or two at a time in that same community aren't visible. So. You know, for the public's mind, it's easy to say there is nothing but losses as a result of free trade. It doesn't benefit me or my family. America loses. I mean, that, the, and, but the second most critical part is we've lost the messaging on NAFTA already. Lessons learned. The question is, will we lose the messaging on CAFTA, <coughs> Korea, Colombia, Panama, um, where we're going on TTIP um, and uh, TPA? Or excuse me, trans Pacific Partnership as well. Um, we've talked about this, how we really focus for these trade agreements on trade messaging. And for that brief period, I think business supporters are extremely effective, but then you know it fades back away and we don't engage again. But those who oppose trade, boy, they are writing on that blackboard, they are on those blogs, they are hammering every day. And so the, the short answer is that if we want to get back the momentum on trade and keep it to make these arguments, we can't walk away, again, to use a football analogy, we keep walking off the field. Mm -hmm. You know, on the messaging, we, we've got to stay on there 24-7. What do you think? I think people are always scared to misspeak or what have you, or not uh, create the most positive message possible. But what they forget is when you seed the playing field, you lose. And um, you know, I'm not saying everything is perfect everywhere, but one thing I do know is those 20 countries have been remarkable success stories. We have a trade surplus with 15 or 16 of them. We just, you know, a lot of times life is repetition and amplification. And often in business, you'll give one speech on a topic and say, well, I've done my part. In reality, you have to repeat the theme over and over and louder and louder. NAFTA has been a phenomenally positive agreement. The other 18 FTAs have been even more so, and we have to keep at it. One thing I want to now, one example I think Americans always get, certainly Texans, look, you and I can go within a mile of here, go to a local mall, we can buy a product from just about any country in the world. But when we try to sell our U.S. products, 
into those countries. Oftentimes, we have these America need not apply signs, you know, stuck up. You know, we have barriers. So free trade agreements tear down those signs, allow us to sell two way in, in there. We're incredibly good at it. When we can frame some of these issues into the day-to-day -day life of our constituents, I think we stand a better chance of winning. There again, I have to, in terms of amplification and repetition, if the Congressman will allow me, remind everyone of the study by Huffbauer, Nolan, Robinson, and Moran we released last week going through the trade effects of the proposed po trade policies of two presidential candidates. And on our website is a simulation or shows you the results county by county in the U.S., industry by industry. So please tell your constituents, your friends back home, your relatives who are not part of the Washington uh, Chatterbox Network to go look at this. And, and, and it helps trace out. It's not quite the same as no, the Congressman I, says about you know that plant in that town, but it gets you there and it helps you trace it out. So please make use of that. And thanks for doing the hard work. You know what I mean, of identifying that, because I, I think we can win this debate on trade. I'm, I'm absolutely confident we can, but it's, it takes the tools that you're developing here at Peterson to do we, it. We, so. I'm very proud of our team, which did great work, and we're very grateful to you and everyone for helping us get the message out. We need to, in football, we're the equipment managers. You guys have to go get it across <laughs> the board, across the line. Uh, going to the back, Mike, next two questions, uh, Yeah, Len Bracken, reporter with Bloomberg BNA. Um, earlier today, uh, Speaker Ryan said that there weren't enough votes for TPP. Uh, Chairman Brady, would you give us your snapshot of uh, where the votes stand with regard to uh, the TPA vote last year, where you've lost votes, um, where you've gained, perhaps, and, um, and do you still have the majority of the majority supporting the TPP? You know, I'm not going to go through the um, uh, count of where members are at. Because at this point, in my experience, sort of bears this out, until you have a date for a vote, you know, members for the most part will stay undecided. You know, they'll raise their issues with you, um, talk about what concerns them, and also where it's going well, whether it's in beef or, you know, financial services or some other area. Um, what I know is that Republicans are, in my view, as strongly pro-trade and open markets uh, as we've been before. I think we're going to max out uh, the Republican votes uh, if these remaining issues are resolved on TPP. We've got 28 courageous Democrats in the House, and we hope more who will step forward and support the President's uh, 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 trade agreement. Um, but all that's contingent upon solving these remaining issues. And again, the clock's ticking. White House needs to pick up the pace. We've got to have these issues resolved sooner rather than later if we hope to have a vote in the lame duck. Um. Hi. Um, Doug Palmer with, yeah. Polit Hi, Doug. with Politico. Um, I just wanted to ask about uh, a paper that the Trump campaign put out over the weekend. And um, one of the issues that it raised is an issue that uh, I know has been out there, but it hasn't been talked a lot about recently. And it's other uh, countries' value-added tax system. And the Trump campaign cited this as, as an example of provisions that are in trade agreements uh, that show how U.S. negotiators didn't do a very good job because they allowed other countries to keep these value-added tax systems. And the paper sort of suggests that if other countries don't agree to eliminate their value-added tax systems, the, the U.S. should walk away from the, from, from the WTO. I just wondered, how do you yeah. see that issue? Is that something that you think um, creates a big competitive disadvantage um, for the United States? Should that be a top priority of the next administration? And is it so important that if other countries don't agree to eliminate it, we should uh, get out of the WTO? I didn't see the paper, Doug, so won't comment on that. Um, but I will go back to my earlier comments. You know, if we want to grow the economy, free and open trade in these agreements, done right and strictly enforced, are exactly, you know, one of the key parts of growing our economy. Tax reform also plays a role because the more competitive we are around the world, um, inherently, Democrats and Republicans agree it's not enough to just buy American. 
we got to sell American all throughout the world. Free trade agreements open those markets. Our tax code determines how competitive we are in those markets. And in the House Republican blueprint, you know, we go all in for growth on jobs and wages, redesigning the way we tax on Main Street uh, and around the world. And two of the big changes we make um, are one, to stop taxing worldwide, making sure those profits can be reinvested where they make the most sense off in America. And secondly, moving to a border adjustable tax system as our competitors, China, Europe, and others use, so that we're competing on a level playing field. So we are, we are moving from, we're proposing to America to move from an income tax system based on where you produce to a cash flow consumption tax, well, based on where it's consumed. Uh, I'm convinced that that is WTO um, <coughs> compatible. I'm, I absolutely know it'll level the playing field. And so tax and trade, again, are key elements um, in this whole debate. Right. I, just, just to clarify, though, I mean, you would, you would think that the U.S. should fix its tax system rather than ask other countries to fix their tax systems? Again, not having seen the report, but I know that our tax system is ours. If we want to be competitive, you know, we've got to have the most pro-growth, um, job-creating system on the planet. Our tax reform blueprint leapfrogs America from dead last in our global competitors back into that lead pack. I think it's going to have a significant change, significant impact in a positive way on our competitiveness. Can, so can, it, so yeah. they're related, obviously, in a key way. Like just, just to clarify from the analytical side, uh, we have Gary Huffbauer, Chad Bound, and other fellows here working on this issue. Um, two of the claims made either implicitly or explicitly in that report, I'm not going to go through the whole report, but two of the claims made on this statement about taxes are just flat out wrong. Sorry to fact check. That's what we do. Uh, one of them is there is no good correlation between that tax wedge and where our trade def our bilateral trade deficits and surpluses are. It, it may be a factor, but it sure as hell isn't a major factor. You know, if that's what they're if that's their focus, this is the wrong thing. And the second thing is just to note it also doesn't correlate well with which industries we're good at. Um, if you look at U.S. progress in manufacturing and pharmaceuticals and various services, you know, it, 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 it's, the VAT should be very much punitive for certain kinds of goods, not others. And it, again, it doesn't line up with the facts. So the broad idea that the congressman raises, the question you raise, that obviously taxes matter is true, but just as with many other claims being made on the analytical side by that campaign, uh, it just, is, is not right, what they say. Uh, I have last question, I'm afraid the Congressman has to go, please, at the back mic. Uh, Carolyn Freund, Peterson in Institute. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the Exim Bank. You talk about level playing field, uh, and the Exim Bank is still con constrained, uh, can, can't make loans of $10 million or more. Uh, because it doesn't have a quorum. And I know there was talk this week of getting, lang or last week of getting language, uh, uh, reducing that constraint on the quorum. I was wondering uh, what's happening on that and if you see any hope uh, for, that to, for that to change. Thanks. You know, I have to confess, um, we've been so focused on the tax reform blueprint and the TPP and the whole trade agenda. I haven't spent a whole lot of brain power over on Exxon Bank, I'm aware of the circumstance. I don't know what the proposals are going forward. I'd like to see that bank operating um, effectively, but that's a that's an area that other, frankly, committees are covering right now. Again, thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut this off. It's been a great discussion. The congressman had a hard stop at one o'clock. Yeah. So, Adam, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Me. This Appreciate was terrific. You. Please join me in thanking.